Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us into your house one more time. Uh, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for keeping us all during the week, bringing us across the highways, Father, as we travel to and fro to work our various destinations. You've been so very, very good to us, been so kind to us, been so thankful for all that you've done, Father. So grateful for all that you've done for us. And God, as we sit in, in your house on this morning, you said that wherever two or three would gather, that you would be in the midst of them. And we know that you're here now. We feel your presence even now. And God, we ask that I stand before your people for these brief moments that you would please move Eric Murphy out of the way. Lord, speak to your people through your word. Let them to hear you clearly on this morning, Father. And we ask that you would just tender our hearts to receive from you, Lord. Word my mouth. Give me what to say and how to say it, that it may reach someone where they are. And I thank you right now in advance for what shall be done. And Father, we will be mindful and careful to give your name the praise. We'll give your name the glory. We'll give your name the honor for everything that is said and done in this place. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen amen i'm just grateful to uh, be here on this morning wanted to uh let you all know uh sister dooley had to step out we missed deacon dooley on this morning um, but he had a procedure and uh, he did say uh, to please keep him in prayer but he still has some things attached to his body and he said i i, I didn't want to scare anybody coming to church this morning so uh, deacon dooley is not here but we do miss him and please uh also we're keeping brother hank's brother uh earnest in prayer he's having uh, surgery today amen and so we're believing god to uh, carry him through i also wanted to say thank you um, to two groups of people. I want to say thank you to those who met over at the former youth building and helped clear it out. Amen. Uh, we still had some things over there and so thank you all of those who went through and we had a lot of stuff over there. Amen. Still, uh, but help clearing that out for what we're going to do with the building next. But I appreciate that. I'm very grateful, uh, grateful for that. And I want to say thank you. Uh, you know, I was at work and we were due to have the rest of our chairs delivered um, this past Thursday between 4 and 6. And the driver called me at about 10 a.m. and said, hey, I'm running ahead of schedule. I'm going to be there at noon. And I was racking my brain trying to think what we're going to do. We, you know, were supposed to meet there. And I forgot we had some retirees in this church. Amen. Amen. And so I called one of them and I said, can you call brother so-and-so and see, can y'all meet him at noon? He said, all right. And so he called and said, we can do it. And so uh, they met him here and, and offloaded the chairs. And so I want to say thank you to Pastor Johnson. Amen. Amen. And thank you to Brother Leo Hilliard, amen, for taking care of that. So I was able to stay at work the rest of the day. Not that I wanted to, but anyway. Uh, and Brother Travis, amen. Amen. Thank the Lord for Brother. So thank you all for that. Amen. And just thank God for all of you. Amen. I'm glad to see Brother Johnny back there. Amen. Amen. And Sister Crystal and Brother Brandon. Amen. And we have someone with us today. And I'm not going to say that he's a visitor. Amen. He's family. And so we're grateful to have, amen, not brother, but Reverend uh, Fabian Ron Hale with us today. Amen. The Lord has done. Amen. And you all still hear me preach about a young man um, that was an atheist and did not believe in God. And the Lord saved that young man. And some of you uh, don't know who that is because he was not here by the time you came here. But that's Brother Fabian sitting back there. And so, amen. So not only did the Lord save him, amen, but the Lord called him into the ministry, amen. So we thank God for him being with us. He said he was going to be here on today, and so we thank God for him being home on today, amen. Amen. We're getting ready to go into the word of the Lord. If you have your Bibles, would you please turn with me to the book of John, the 11th chapter. John, the 11th chapter. 
Amen. John the 11th chapter. And I'm going to read from the King James Version on today. Amen. John the 11th chapter, reading from the King James Version. Amen. And when you're there, you can say amen. And those that are able, would you please oblige and stand for the reading of God's word? Amen. God's word. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. And it and it reads, Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent word unto him to Jesus saying Lord behold he whom thou lovest is sick and when Jesus heard that he said this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified thereby now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus Verse 6, and when he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Verse 7, and then after he, that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. And his disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of the world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. 11, verse 11, These things said he, and after he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. How be, be it Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking rest in sleep, natural sleep. Verse 14, then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Verse 16, then said Thomas, uh, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. And when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave for four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem about 15 furloughs off about two miles uh, and verse uh, 19 and many of the Jews came to Mary uh, Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother and then Martha as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming went and met him but Mary sat still in the house then said Martha unto Jesus Lord if thou hadst been here my brother had not died but I know that even now Whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, he will give it to thee. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And she said unto him, Yeah, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which shall come into the world. And when she had said, said so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come, and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, verse 30, but was in 
that place where Martha met him. And the Jews then which were with her in the house and comforted her when they saw Mary that she rose up hastily and went out. They followed her saying, she goeth unto the grave to weep there. And then when Mary was come to where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell down at his feet saying unto him, Lord, again, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. And when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, and Jesus wept. And the Jews said, behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaning in himself, coming to a gra the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus said, take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said, Lord, by this time he stinketh. For he hath been dead for four days. And Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believest that thou should see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot in grave clothes. And his face was bound with the napkin. And Jesus said, loose him. And let him go. Then many of the Jews, verse 45, came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did and believed on him. Amen. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. I just want to speak to you today from the subject, I'm so glad he waited. I'm so glad that he waited. Amen. And this account revolves around a family of three siblings, two sisters, Mary and Martha, and a brother, Lazarus. Lazarus. And this is not the first time that we hear their names or hear the names of the sisters. There's another account. Uh, and this is the same Mary and Martha who took Jesus into their home. Uh, and hosted him when he came into town and Martha was the one who was preparing the food and Mary was the one who made the decision to sit, sit at Jesus' feet and to receive from him. Uh, this is also a little later in the 12th chapter uh, when Jesus was at Lazarus' home that it is Mary who breaks open an uh, alabaster jar and pours expensive spikenard on his feet and begins to dry his feet uh, with her hair. And some got a little riled up because of the expense of the oil uh, and thought that she was wasting it. That's the same Mary uh, that, they, that they're talking about. Uh, and this is the thing. Jesus had spent quality time with this family outside of just doing ministry. That's how you know uh, the relationship, Pastor Johnson, that you have with somebody. Because there's co-workers, uh, there's people that you work with, and then there's people that you spend time with outside of work. Those are the ones that you are close with. They were more than just acquaintances with them. And he ate meals at their home. He fellowshiped uh, with them. There was a kinship and a closeness between the four of them. And it was so close uh, that their relationship that when Lazarus, their brother, got sick, his sister sent word to Jesus. And listen to this. The wording of the message uh, that they sent and the way they said it speaks volumes about the depth of relationship that they had. Because when they sent word to Jesus, they simply said, Jesus, the one who you love, is sick. They didn't
didn't say Lazarus of Bethany. They didn't say our brother. They said the one you love is sick. And just by saying that alone, Jesus immediately knew who it was because I'm sure he loved a whole lot of people. But there was a special love and a kinship and a closeness that he had for Lazarus that they just said, listen, man, the one you love is sick. And he knew who it was. Now, I want you to hear me and, and, and hear me clearly. They said, he whom you love is sick. He whom you love is sick. I'll break it down a little bit further. Someone the Lord loves is sick. You would think that someone who had this close of a relationship with the master, the healer, would have some type of spiritual immunity, Pastor Justin. You would think somebody this close to Jesus would at least maybe have access to uh, emergency recovery, a speedy recovery. Uh, you would think that they would be exempt from illness, exempt uh, from Uh, by the millions there have been times and if you look at the history of Israel and even what's going on right that to hear somebody say God loves them it, it would be questionable but he really does love Israel as a matter of fact his love the fact that they are in existence today as a nation is a testament to the love of God for them. And make no mistake, and, and I'm gonna move on, but not only does he love them, God is their defender. Amen. When I saw those rockets flying, I wasn't even worried. Yes, it's horrible to see that, but I know this, the whole world can turn against Israel and they're gonna be all right. Amen. God, God loves Israel. But to see the trials that they have endured, Pastor Johnson, someone would look at that, somebody, somebody from the outside looking in would say, well, you know what? The Lord sure has an interesting way of showing love. You could look at today's account and look at Jesus' response to the urgent news about the one he loved, Lazarus. Uh, and, and the Bible said that now Jesus loved his sisters and he loved Lazarus. And when he got the news, that Lazarus was sick, he stayed two more days where he was. The one you love is sick and nigh unto death, and he waits two more days in the place that he is. He stayed put. And here's the thing, Jesus doesn't even seem to have a sense of urgency. The family is panicked, and he's not. They're desperate, and he seems unbothered. He said, the one whom you love is sick. And he carries on business as usual for another 48 hours. Now, let me tell you something. If you say you love me, I'm going to ask y'all. I should say how many of y'all love me. You know, I'm going to say, you know. If you say you love me and you find out that I'm on my deathbed, I would hope, Pastor Johnson, that 
you would hop on the next thing smoking. Yes. Plane, train, or automobile. And get to where I am. And yet Jesus said, the one you love is sick. And he said, okay. He said, but did you hear the message? Yeah. All right. And he continues on for one day with his business and goes to bed and gets up the next day and makes breakfast, I'm sure. I'm just, y'all allow me for a minute, you know, and those about his normal things that he does for the day. And then he turns in again for another night, all the while knowing that his friend that he loves dearly is near and at the point of death. And somebody say, that's not love. Come on, y'all can be honest. That's not love, that's a lack of concern. And here's the thing, Bethany was only about two miles from Jerusalem. So it wasn't a long journey. And yet the Bible says he stayed where he was. But here's the thing, Jesus says something that gives us a clear understanding about his demeanor. He said, this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God that the Son may be glorified through it. Our friend Lazarus is asleep and I'm going to wake him up. <laughs> and this is the thing. When you have spiritual insight, it changes everything. Oh my God. Because when you know the outcome before you even come out, listen, Pastor Johnson, it changes your perspective on everything. And when God has already assured you the victory ahead of the fight, you can rejoice in the middle of the battle. And this is the thing that I've learned. Even when you don't have details, you can have the assurance that you know what? God is up to something here. Is there anybody that's ever been there before? That, that there are things that are going on and you can't quite put a name to it. There are things that I am experiencing and I can't quite explain it. And people will come to you and ask you what's going on. Or they may even be like Job. And they said, have you sinned that God has allowed such a thing to come upon you? And people around may not understand. Job didn't understand. But even Job was able to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust trust him and how was he able to come to such a place of trust without having an explanation because Job understood something that God is sovereign and even if he does not explain his plan ahead of time if he has not laid it out and explained to me what it is that he's doing even if I don't have an understanding of what he's doing I know that he's doing something and that's the thing about God, Pastor Johnson. He, 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 he doesn't often time give us a heads up when something is coming. I'm sure Lazarus didn't know that his sickness was coming up on him. I'm sure that his sisters had no idea that he was going to be near death in a matter of moments. But God knew. And when God gives you some type of spiritual insight, you can have peace. Oh, I've been in situations, look, though I didn't see my way out of it. I didn't know when the trial was going in. There was something down on the inside of me that allowed me to, it's the peace of God. Do you understand? The Bible said the peace of God passeth all understanding. It means it does not make sense. It doesn't make sense that you just receive news that your loved one is sick and you wait two days. You don't fall to pieces, Pastor Johnson. You don't fall out on the floor. But he had an understanding and he had some insight. And he said, you know what? He said, Lazarus is, is just sleep. And this sickness is it's not unto death. And the thing that I've learned is God is never, do you hear me? God is never in a hurry. Never in a hurry. You get in a hurry. You, you like to make haste. You, you like to watch your, 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 your watch and, and the clock. But God is never in a hurry. And his timetable will never line up with yours. God is never in a hurry. And this is the thing about us. 
Nobody likes to be kept waiting. Not for a few minutes. I was in the drive-thru the other day. And somebody was there a few minutes longer than what they thought they should have to. And all of a sudden, I, I heard tires screeching. And the car got out of line and sped around. I said, well, I guess somebody else is going to get that food today. But we don't like to be kept waiting. Not for a few minutes, not for hours, and certainly not for days and months. But understand what I'm saying on this morning. If you are in a trial and God has kept you waiting and God is keeping you waiting, that waiting has nothing to do with God and it has everything to do with you. If you are in a place of uncertainty in your life and you have sent out word as Mary and Martha did, Lord, I need you to come not tomorrow, not next week. I need you to come right now. Anybody ever been there before? And God has not yet come. I want to assure you it's not that he hasn't heard you. It's not that he's not capable of coming to your rescue. It's not that he does not have the power to do what you're asking him. But if God has you waiting, it has nothing to do with him and everything to do with you. I want you to go with me to the book of James, the first chapter. And the second verse. If God has you waiting for something, and I know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to rehash my testimony. But if God has you waiting, it has everything to do with you. James, the first chapter, and the second verse. Y'all there? Amen. Some of y'all still turning. All right. He said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. He said, count it all joy. Well, what's to rejoice about? When you're being tried, when you're going through, when, you've been put, when you're being put through the ringers, he said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation. And this is why. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work that you might be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That trial is working something in you, Pastor Johnson. Yeah. Amen. Trouble is working something, even sickness. I know people who've gotten sick, and there might be someone in here today. I know people who have gotten sick, and all of a sudden they become one of the most spiritual people you ever want to know. Yeah. Oh my, listen, because there's something about sickness, especially when they put a timeline on it. You got six months. You got two years. All of a sudden, it, your mind begins to turn from the things of earth to the things that really matter. Because the Bible said that the things of this earth are just temporary. But it's the things that are unseen that are eternal. And all of a sudden, I watched my own father. And let me tell you, my daddy was saved, but he was a little carnal sometimes. You know, he spent a whole lot of time in the television, just like some of y'all. Amen. You can say amen. You can say amen. He spent a whole lot of time in the television. Uh, but about the last week, and this is how my, mom, my mother told me I wasn't there that day, but she said about the last week of his life, every time my, my father spent a lot of time in the hospital. And, and you can count on it, if he was in the hospital and there was a television in his room, that thing was going to be on. If, if, if you came into his hospital room, uh, you know, and you tried to talk to him, he'd have to tell you, hold on a minute. And, and he'd pause it because, hey, listen, uh, as my former pastor used to call it, the one-eyed monster was on. Listen, but the last week of my father's life before the Lord took him home, my mother said she knew that it was something different because in his hospital room, she went in there and the television was off. And she even told him, 
You don't want to turn the TV on? You want me to get to the remote? And he said, no, I got to get myself together. There are things that God has allowed to come into our lives. And sometimes we get upset and we get angry, you know, but God is working something. Oh my God. Yes, he is. You, do you not know that some of you wouldn't pray if it wasn't for trials? <laughs> do you not know that some of your Bibles will still have dust, dust collected on the cover if it wasn't for heartache and hardship? Come on. The reason uh, that you memorize Romans 8 and 28 and we know that all things work together to the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose because there was a whole lot of stuff that was going on in your life that you didn't understand and you had to find the scripture to keep you from losing your mind and so you said what was that Bible verse that I remember them teaching me in Sunday school 30 years ago because you ain't opened it since then uh, and you know and it was that trial that caused you to dig in your Bible and find Romans 8 and 28 and you'd wake up every morning and say and we know for we know all things are working together and so sometimes God allows things to come into our lives to draw us unto himself and so if God has you in a place and he hasn't answered yet he said it's because I'm working something I want somebody to say, say he's working something yes he is He's working something. And Mary and Martha didn't know it unbeknownst to them. No, the sickness was not unto death. And it really wasn't about death. But God was trying to do something on the inside of them. Because you see, they had enough faith to send word to Jesus. And they believed that if Jesus came, that he had the power to change their brother's condition. But what God was saying was, yes, you have faith. But what if I take longer than you anticipate? Will you still believe me? Mary and Martha, what if you don't get an answer? Will you still trust me? Uh, because the Bible said that we have all been dealt a measure of faith. And this is the thing that I've learned. Faith has to grow. Hallelujah. Huh? Faith has to be developed. Some of you, us have a mustard seed faith. And that's all we're, we're happy with that, Pastor Johnson. I got faith the size of a mustard seed. But God has to increase our faith. That God desires that we go from faith to faith and glory to glory. That there are levels of trusting God. It's one thing to trust God to heal a headache. And a something all together to trust God to heal cancer. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. Hello, can I testify? It's one thing to trust God, to believe God, to help you pay a $400 rent on a building and something all together to trust him for a lease, a mortgage, excuse me, for a mortgage. It's one thing for you to trust God to teach a Sunday school lesson and something all together different for you to trust God to preach. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. And faith has to increase. And so he said, Mary and Martha, uh, yes, you sent word and you have faith and believe that if I come, that I can work. But what if I don't come? Do you still believe that I'm God and that I'm able? What, oh, here we go. What if you don't get the answer? Will you trust me? Or what if your brother's condition worsened? Will you still believe that I am able? Or here's the one that we don't like. Or what if I wait? God asks, what if I wait until you think that it's absolutely too late? Will you still believe that I'm God? I heard a pastor's testimony and he became ill and asked God because God doesn't always answer yes. He asked God to heal his body and the condition 
got worse and one of his pastor friends said, God hasn't heard your prayer. He said, and let me ask you, what are you going to do if God doesn't heal you? He said, well, I'm still going to preach to others that he is a healer. Amen. <laughs> what if I wait until you think that it's absolutely too late? And I've seen God do just that. Because if you ask the children of Israel, when they were being pursued by Pharaoh and his army, and they were right up against the Red Sea, and their captors were pursuing them. And they looked across that body of water and saw an army behind them. If you had asked them about the timing of God, they would have said, it's too late, Pastor Johnson. But I've learned that God is not operating on our timetable. And I'm so glad, hallelujah, that even when it seems like he's late, he's right on time. And Jesus had received word, and here's the thing, he received word while Lazarus was still alive. And he intentionally waited until he passed to go to, into Judea. And the Bible does not say that anybody told Jesus that Lazarus had died, but he perceived in his spirit that he had died and said, he's fallen asleep, and now let's go wake him up. And this is the thing, when Jesus arrived, he was greeted by quite a scene because some other Jews had traveled to mourn with family and to observe a traditional time of mourning. And you know, much like we do, you know how people bring food to the house. You know, and when, when uh, death happens, some of us put on weight. Listen, I had, when my, uh, my father passed, I had uh, King Ranch chicken. Uh, enchiladas, rice, beans, pineapple upside down cake, seven up cake, you know, uh, but much like we do, people had come and heard the news that Lazarus had passed and they had gathered to observe an official time of mourning with a family and they came and when Jesus come, and you know how we do, we look through the photo albums and this was, by the time Jesus showed up, mind you, this was the repast. Uh, because they didn't do like some of us do, Pastor Johnson. You know, somebody dies on a Saturday, and three weeks later, <laughs> y'all know how we do. They had already buried him, and so by the time that he showed up, this was the repast. Uh, this was the after effect, and he shows up, and, and people are, are, are grieving, and they're mourning, and they're crying with the, the sisters about their brother's death. And Martha hears that Jesus has finally come. And when he comes into town, she, she leaves the house, goes to where he is, and the first thing she says to Jesus is, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It, there was no, how was your trip? Good to see you again. Do you want something to drink? Are you hungry? Would you like to sit down? The first thing she says to him is, man, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't be dead right now. That's like some of us. There are often times that we get to God and before we've made supplication, before we've had thanksgiving, hallelujah. Listen, when you come into God's presence, I've learned, huh? that you ought to come with pray first, Lord, before I ask you for anything, I want to tell you thank you for the things that you've already done. Before I make my request known, Father, thank you for keeping me. Uh, thank you for, for delivering me. Thank you for saving me. But oftentimes we come into God's presence and just like Martha, it's a time of accusation. Why haven't you done this? And Lord, look at my list. You haven't answered the first thing yet. And I've got about five other things that I've been waiting. And she said, if you had been here when we call for you, our brother wouldn't be dead right now. But what she says next reveals exactly what God was trying to do in this situation. Because she said, if you hadn't been here, my brother wouldn't be dead. But... 
I know even now who you are and I know this that whatever you ask God he's going to give it to you understand this is what God was after because she had a level of faith but this went beyond what she was used to because they were used to calling on Jesus and seeing him lay hands on the sick and then recover right there in front of their eyes but all of a sudden the time had expired for that type of miracle how do you receive a miracle when you're already on the other side of the grave how do you receive a miracle when they've already taken your vitals and they can't find a heartbeat anymore? How do you receive a miracle when the crowd has already come and pronounced you dead? But this is what God was after. She said, yes, he has died and I know that he's graveyard dead, but I also know who you are. Hallelujah. I know that right now this situation looks impossible but I also know this that with God nothing shall seem impossible and this is what God was working sometimes you got to go through the process huh sometimes you listen sometimes you got to go from point A to point B and it's then that you begin to understand they would say listen I don't understand it but I will understand it better by and by and we begin to see in this moment this is what God was trying to do the whole time Martha you've got faith but your faith is about to go to a whole nother level yes my brother is dead but you're Jesus hallelujah huh yes we're in grief but I believe that weeping only endures for a night and if I trust in you joy is getting ready to come in the morning glory Yes, it looks as though everything is over, but you are God. And like you, there is none other. And I trust you. Sometimes, listen, you got to trust God when you can't trace his hand. You've got to trust God when you don't understand what it is that he's doing. And she said, but even now, and this is what God wants in us, I know. There's some things that you can say, I think. I may, but to say, I know. I know. There's something, listen, I know that God is a healer. How do you know? I've seen him do it before. I know that God, I know there's some things that not even Satan can make you doubt. I know that God is a deliverer. Eric, how do you know that God is a deliverer? Listen, I'm telling you what I know. I've stood toe to toe with the devil that tried to tell me that you need a 12 step program. Let me tell you what I know. I know that God is a deliverer. Do you want to know how I know? Because God delivered me one day. I know that God can heal issues of the mind. Do you know, you want to know how I know that? Because he healed my mind. I know, let me tell you, I know that God can overnight deliver you from depression. Hold on. Without medication. Do you want to know how Eric Murphy knows that? Because God delivered me from depression. And she said, I know even now, Jesus, that whatever you ask of God, He'll give it to you. And she said, he said, your brother is going to rise again. And God never misspeaks. But he says what he means and he means what he says. He said, your brother will rise again. And she said, we get so smart sometimes. We said, oh, I know. I know he's going to rise in the general resurrection on the great day with everybody else he's gonna get up then and that's not what he was saying he said woman <laughs> sometimes we settle and God is trying to do something extraordinary God said I'm gonna save your husband 
I'm going to save your wife. Yes. And they start coming to church. And you say, oh, that's good enough for me. And God said, I didn't say that they were going to start attending church faithfully. That might be the start of it. But I said, I was going to save them. And she said, see, because my mother, God told her, I'm going to save your husband, my daddy. And we would get excited when he would come to church. Because that was, that was not his thing. So he'd come to church and we'd say, oh, daddy came to church today. And maybe this is it. Oh, he went through all kinds of sickness and heart attacks. And we say, well, maybe he could. And it looked like it just wasn't going to happen. And if other people would tell her, I don't know, Primus is a, seemed like he a lost cause. And he, let me tell you. <laughs> you want to talk about an impossibility? Because he was smart. And he'd argue, he could tell you, he knew scripture. He'd argue you down. Tell me I need to go to church. I don't need some man to tell me about God. I know God. And how do you know I don't have a relationship with God? For my, and he quotes scripture. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him and spirit and in truth. I can worship him in spirit and truth right here in my own house. Ali May. That's okay. <laughs> That's, that was my daddy. Y'all don't know him. That was my daddy. But God didn't say I'm going to bring Primus Murphy into church. God said I'm going to save him. And when God speaks a thing, he will not come short of his word. And he said, woman, your brother will rise again. And she said, yeah, well, well I understand that. And I accept he'll rise again in the general resurrection. He said, woman, the general resurrection, I am the resurrection. <laughs> And I am the life. And listen, and he that believeth in me. Do you believe God? Yes. I'm asking you all a question this morning. Do you really believe God? Because some of us say we believe him. And it's really just lip service. Said that I am the resurrection, the life. And he that believeth on me, though he were dead. Dead in your sins and dead in your trespasses. Though he were dead, yet shall he live. Said, woman, I'm the resurrection and the life. And he goes about his business undeterred. He said, where have you laid him? And I learned sometimes, Pastor Johnson, God doesn't want to hear a whole lot of drama and a whole lot of belly aching. He just wants you to take him to the source of the problem. Where is it? You say, Lord, it's my son. Okay. Lord, it's my mind. Okay. Lord, I need a new job. Okay. Take him to the source of the problem. He said, where have you laid him? And here goes doubt again. Even in the mist. And the people watched him and said, isn't this this man who opened blinded eyes? And surely... He couldn't keep this man from dying, talking doubt in the midst, on the way to a miracle, about to see the power of God move. And even then they were whispering. But I've learned, listen, when God has spoken a thing, it doesn't matter what the naysayers say. Can I tell you? It doesn't even matter what you say. And you're about to see because no, he's on his way. And Martha had already said, listen, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't be dying. And here, and here comes her sister. And Mary comes to Jesus and said, hey, I know Martha already told you, but I'd like to remind you, if you had been here when we called you, our brother wouldn't have died. But God is not a man that he should lie. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus said, in the, from the beginning, he's not dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's just asleep. And Pastor Johnson, what do you do when somebody sleep? You wake them up. <laughs> he said, where have you laid him? And the Bible said that he saw all of the unbelief. 
and said it in one of the shortest verses in the Bible. We were in church and you used to make us uh, memorize and quote Bible verses. And this was a favorite. Listen, this was a go-to. <laughs> Jesus wept. That's it. Hey. Said that Jesus wept. And people around said, oh, how he loved him. Oh, he's broken up. This is going to be a hard one for him to get over. It's, it's so sad. And they had no idea why would he be crying over Lazarus when he already knew he's not dead. He was weeping because of their unbelief. Do you not know Pat, Mother Johnson, Sister Johnson? She said, faith that pleases God this morning is spiritual empowerment. Do you not know that just as our faith pleases him, our unbelief grieves him? Yes. Said, do you know that I am God? And I'm able to do the impossible. Do you know that I am God and I can do anything but fail? Do you recognize that I am God and not only can I do anything but fail, but there is no failure in me at all? Do you know that you serve a God that has never lost a battle? Do you know that you serve, I'm talking to you this morning. Uh, we'll get back to the Jews and we'll get back to Mary and Martha and the family in a minute. I'm talking to you this morning. Do you know that you, have, that you serve a God that has never lost a battle? Do you know that you serve a God that is undefeated? Do you know that you serve a God that every promise that he has ever made, he will keep? Amen. You serve a God that the Bible said that heaven and earth itself will pass away, but my word will never fail. Amen. Do you know that? He said, if you would just believe, you shall see the glory of God. And he tells them in that moment, take the stone away. And again, here unbelief creeps in because Martha said, wait a minute. He's dead. And he's been dead for four days. <laughs> and by now, he stinks. By now, and I'm not trying to gross you out, but the maggots have gotten to him. Huh? By now, rigor mortis has set in. By now, his skin has started to change colors. By now his body is bloated because see they didn't embalm then. Amen. Said by now he stinks. And Jesus said this is the thing. There was a belief even in that time. God is so strategic that there was a superstition that the soul would linger around the body for three days. And, and sometimes where in there there might be a chance for that person to come back. But about the fourth day they were dead dead if you get what I'm saying. That there was no chance and maybe just perhaps he was waiting to go beyond superstition. Uh, to go beyond maybe it was a misdiagnosis and he was just breathing real shallow and they didn't catch his breath. Uh, to go beyond all of that to where there's no doubt that if somebody is stinking, there's no doubt that they are dead. And God, I've learned that God is so intentional that even his delays have purpose. I've learned that God will wait until you run out of all of your ideas, Pastor Johnson, with your smart self. I've learned that God will wait until you have exhausted all of your resources and gone through every viable option. I've learned that God sometimes will wait until you've called every single one of your friends, until you've talked to your therapist, until you've talked to your advisor even until you've gone to your pastor and taken counsel. I've learned that sometimes God will wait like the woman with the issue of blood until you've gone 12 years and gone to every physician in town and used up all of your money and you're still no better. 
And after you have gone through all of that and you've come to the end of yourself, then he steps in. Why? Because God says, when I do what it is that I'm going to do, listen, your accountant won't get the glory for him. <laughs> huh? Your therapist won't get the glory for him. Your husband is not going to get the glory for it. Your degree won't get the glory for it. Your experience and your intellect won't get the glory for it. But God said, when I move, there will be no doubt that God has done this thing. And when God moves, listen, there's nothing that you can say but to God be the glory for the things that he has done. And she said, he's stinking by now. And Jesus said, take the stone away. And he said, didn't I tell you if you believe that you would see the glory of God? Is there anybody that wants to see his glory? The Bible said that he took the stone away. They took the stone away. And in that moment, Jesus lifted up his voice and he said, Father, I thank you that you hear me. And sometimes God wants us a witnesses. And he said, I know, hallelujah, I know that you always hear me. There's no doubt in my mind. And see, can I tell you something? Sometimes that's my frustration as a pastor because I can tell you what God has done in my own life, but I want you to experience it for yourself. He said, I know that God, I know that you hear me. You always hear my prayer. But Father, you've done this for your name's sake. Lord, this has occurred and I know why he's, why he's dead. I know why uh, he's been allowed to die. But this is so that your glory can be revealed. And for the sake of these people that are watching, for the sake of Mary and Martha who are weeping right now and accusing me of not caring and being late, for the sake of all of these Jews that have just said, I know how to open blinded eyes, but I can't raise the dead. For the sake of all of those that even might be standing here and watching and they don't really believe that I'm your son. I want you to move by your power. Oh my God. Lord, I want you to move in such a way. Listen, I was there when you spoke out into the void of darkness and you called the sun, the moon, the stars into being. So I know your power for myself. And God, maybe they haven't witnessed it in such a way, but God, for their sake, I'm asking you to move on my behalf. And the Bible says that Jesus spoke and said, Lazarus, come forth I heard somebody say listen he called Lazarus by name and he was specific because if he hadn't the whole graveyard would have gotten up hallelujah said I'm not talking to you I'm not talking to you over there Rosie I'm not talking to Paul but Lazarus come forth and the Bible said that he that had been dead for four days Pastor Johnson he that was stinking, he that they were mourning over, came out leaping and it's still wrapped up in his grave clothes. And when God moves, he does a thorough job. And he said, loose that man and let him go. Hallelujah. And the grave clothes fell off. I'm telling you. From the very beginning of the thing. God knows the end from the beginning. From the very beginning. This was God's intent. And it was his purpose. And sometimes God has you in a place of waiting. So that he can reveal his glory. Amen. Oh he hasn't come through yet. But it doesn't mean that he's not going to. And just because it's been delayed. Does not mean that it has been denied. And sometimes God keeps us waiting. I've learned that if God sometimes moves, we get spoiled sometimes. That if God does what it is that we're asking, it, in, in the moment that we're asking it, I just believe that we wouldn't appreciate it the way we do. We had to wait 14 years for my daddy to get saved. 14 years from the time of the promise 
to the manifestation. And let me tell you something. Some of y'all were there that day. Can I tell you my position when the Lord saved my daddy? I had my face in the pew weeping before the Lord. Because some of y'all, if God did it overnight and, and that person that you've been praying for came through the doors and got saved today, this would be you. Oh, thank you, Lord. Well, then, isn't that wonderful? But, but when you've had to labor over that thing, when you've had to pray and say, Lord, do you even hear me? Do you care? And when he finally comes through, oh my God. When, hold on, when you thought it was over with. When you thought it was too late. You thought it was impossible. When you had finally, you had even gotten to the point, if you're honest with yourself, that you had given up and said, you know what? I don't think that it's ever going to happen. When God waits until that moment and he moves, oh my God, it's a whole nother story. Listen. And after I have seen God move in my own life, I'm talking about down to the wire. I haven't told y'all all the stories, the things that I've been through, and I want God to let some of y'all experience some of this stuff so you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when we were in the middle of building this and we had run out of money. And the contractor looked at me and said, if we don't get some money, we're getting ready to stop working. And I called the bank and said, after they said, listen to me, after the bank said, no, you can't have any more money. You are maxed out. I called them and I said, listen, we really need this money. And the bank said, send me this, send me that, and we'll see what we can do. A month, listen to me, a whole month went by and I hadn't heard anything. And the whole time, the contractor's texting me every week, say, Mr. Murphy, we would like to continue. Oh, he was real slick with it. He said, you, we would like to continue working, but we're getting to the point where we're getting ready to have to stop, and I've got some other jobs that I need to go to. A month went by, and I, the last day, he called me, and I was on the phone with him. I said, the bank closes at 5. And I said, I had, he said, have you heard anything? It was the last day. He said, after today, we can't, we got to stop working. I said, I haven't heard anything, but the bank closes at 5 p.m. And I said, I'm going to wait until 5 o'clock. And I said, and then I'll let you know if I hear anything. And it was 5 o'clock. Look at God. I'm on the phone. I picked up the phone. It was 5.30. I picked up the phone to call the contractor and tell him I hadn't heard anything from the bank. While I'm on the phone with the contractor, Glory to your name. While I'm on the phone with the contractor, I get a notification on my phone from my email. And I go to click my email. I said, hold on. I go to click my email, and the bank said, I'm sorry. We were so late getting to you. I just want to let you know y'all been approved. <laughs> Even when you think that it's too late, it's not too late for God. And can I tell you now, I look back and I'm so glad God waited. Hallelujah. I'm so glad that he waited. Amen. He may not come when you want him. But I can assure you, God will be there right on time. I'm so glad that he waited. And I'm a witness. God gets all of the glory. God gets all the glory. It wasn't because we had enough assets in the bank to cover additional money. Because we didn't. huh? It wasn't because we had the collateral. Because we didn't. And when I went, let me tell you, oh Lord, the Lord reminds me sometimes because some, when I went to the bank to sign the paperwork for the loan, the loan officer looked at me and said, you all out of favors with me. And she said, I want to tell you something. This is a major, this is Navy Army, now it's rally. 
she looked at me upstairs in the loan uh, department. She looked at me and she said, and this is the, um, she's over the business loan department. She said, we never do this. Do you hear me? I know some of y'all, it just, she said, we never do this. We have never done this. And this is why God did what he did. Because sitting right there in the loan department, I said, to God be the glory. <laughs> he wanted to make sure that I wouldn't be crazy enough to take the credit for it. Because I knew who had done it. I'm so glad he waited. Hallelujah. And so if you're in a place of waiting, for God to do something in your life you've been asking him to do this is all I want you to do don't lose hope don't give up don't forget what you've asked him to do but resolve within your mind and in your spirit that when he does it he said for your sake I'm glad I wasn't there it's for your sake I'm glad I didn't come through it was for your sake. I'm glad I didn't answer what I did. He said, but I'm going to do this for one reason and one reason only. So that you can see the glory of God. And when God does what he's going to do, because he's going to do it. I want you to resolve within yourself. Lord, I'm going to give you all the glory. I'll take no credit. I'll take no credit for myself. But God, I'll give you all the glory for what you've done. Amen. I want everybody to stand here. We're going home. Everybody stand here. We're going home. Father, I thank you on today. I thank you for these, your people, that are here under the sound of my voice. I thank you for your word, Father, reminding us that you are able to do anything. You're able to do all things. You're able to do anything but fail. There is no failure in you. And God, I thank you right now. Lord, in spite of whatever some of these under the sound of my voice are experiencing, Lord, in spite of what some of them have been waiting for you to do, waiting for you to answer waiting for you to move on their behalf there's some that are believing for the salvation of a loved one there's some of them that are waiting for you to make a financial move in their life some are waiting on promotion lord but whatever they're waiting on father god first i want you to remind them of who you are remind them of what you can do and God, even more, Lord, that when you move on their behalf, remind them that it was you that had done it. God, you had said in your word to wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And I thank you right now. Even in my own life, there are some things that I'm still waiting for you to do. And I know by faith you are going to do that. You're going to do exactly what it is that you said you're going to do. And we thank you right now. Lord, as we stand in your presence, God, remind us of your power and what you're able to do. You are the God of the impossible. God, you do the impossible. You specialize in doing the impossible thing. And I thank you right now, Father, for what you're going to do. We rejoice in the ways that you're going to make, Father. We thank you for the manifestation of every promise, Lord, that you're going to do in our lives. And we give you the glory right now. We give you the praise right now for what you're going to do. And we thank you because we recognize that you are in control. Even when it seems like things are out of control, you're in control of all things at all times. Lord, you're still on the throne. You're still on the throne. And we thank you right now for what you're doing in our lives and what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor Johnson is coming to dismiss us. Yes. 
Oh, okay. Well, well we can do that. Amen. We'll just a really quick uh, prayer request. Um, Father, we thank you right now. You want to meet with Kingdom Academy after church? 